Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. Many of the city's office holders will not be running for re-election next year because of term limits. In fact, I think that only about 16 of the 51 members of the city council will even be able to be candidates. But from what I gather, we're very lucky that James Vacca will be one of them. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank I'm you for having me. Uh, please, it's a pleasure. <laughs> I'm going to call you Jimmy. Fine. And you come from the Bronx. Sure. The southeast corner of the Bronx? Well, is really, that about really what it's it is? The north, it, it's the East Bronx or North Bronx. Oh, yeah? I, 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 was, I thought that part of it was south, no? Well, I, Frog's I, I, Neck. Frog's Neck really is called the East Bronx. It's along the okay. waterfront. And I was born in Pelham Bay, right next door. Part and, of your uh, district? Part of my district. And I represent now the communities of Pelham Parkway, Morris Park, City Island, um, Throgs Neck and Pelham Bay, Zariga. I oh, represent uh, a wonderful community that I was born and raised in and that yeah. I've served for a long time. You've always, you've not only were you born there, you've, lived, you've worked there all your life, have all you? Did you life. ever have another job? Well, I was district manager right. of Community Board 10 for 26 years. <laughs> and before that, I was chairman of the board. And I've been involved in civics and government. I started when I was 13 in the ninth grade of uh, junior high school. So did your parents, were they involved? In no, the no, no. My parents were not. In the yeah. beginning, when they saw that I had an interest uh, in politics, they encouraged me, but yeah. uh, they were not political people. I'm so, well, you're not essentially even a political person, are no. you? Well, I'm, you're political in a broader sense, a broader not sense. in a party sense. Well, my parents could never understand why every Sunday I was watching Meet the Press and Issues and Answers and uh -huh. other political programs on a national basis. Oh, and then I had to get my New York Times every Sunday. So that was this is when I was 12 yeah. and 13. So they saw that I was interested in the overall political world we live in. Right. But I myself come from the community. I come from, a, from civic associations and community groups. And I was president of a senior citizen center for 30 years before I came to the council. Huh. They recruited me when I was 22. And they said to me, would you take the presidency of our center for one year? Because <laughs> the city wanted to move them to another location and they did oh. not want to move. Take it for one year and then we'll take it back. And of course that never happened, but I was president for 30 years of a senior So what, what brought you into it when you were 13? Well, when I was 13, I, I went to a junior high school in the Bronx, and uh, w the number five Bruckner Boulevard MTA bus never came. And we would stand in the rain. Many of us <laughs> would, were taking musical in instruments at the time. And uh, we got soaked constantly. And I said to my fellow students, let's organize a petition drive. Let's tell the MTA that this number five bus has got to come more frequently. And I became head of the student council of the junior high school. We got okay. the petitions. We got the improvement. And from there, I was president of my high school student council. And that became, uh, for me, it's the wonderful. beginning of, of uh, grassroots so you are type really, of work. You're really the kind of candidate we should always have, or That's the kind of public nice. official we should always have. So now you're in the council. Yes. It's your first term. Yes. Third year of your first term. Yes. And are you ready to be part of that, what, I guess, with the senior class? You know, when I was in the council, there weren't term limits. So there were people who were there 25 years more. But now it's a rapid acceleration, isn't it? Yes. I'm ready for that responsibility. I have to tell you, I chair a subcommittee now on senior citizen centers, which is very much in keeping with what I've done. Uh -huh. uh, I'm also co-chairing a task force we have at the council that deals with school governance and what will happen on uh, June 30th of next year when mayoral control of our school system elapses. Oh, is that what happens? Yes. As soon as Bloomberg leaves it? Well, si six months before he leaves, uh, uh, mayoral control will elapse. Isn't that interesting? So will he go back to try to extend the legislation? Well, the current law states that if Albany does nothing, then we will return to the old system. Many people, though, feel that mayoral control also has to be looked at to see how, how we can make it work better. So we've been having um, meetings with uh, stakeholders and advocates now for several months, and I co-chair this task force. Citywide? Yes, citywide. Uh, David Yasky from Brooklyn uh -huh. and I are co-chair of the task force, along with Robert Jackson, the education uh -huh. chair. And it's been a lot of work, but we've learned a lot, and now we're coming together to try to consolidate our thoughts and, and really work out where we think our city should go when it comes to governance. And then what's the relationship you have with the state? You're going to have to bring in the state? Well, we're going to have to bring in the state because we, we are not see what often, happens in the state, right? As you know, we are not often allowed to dictate our own future. Right. We have to go to Albany, and, we, and the uh, New York City school system is a creature of New York State education law. Yeah. And so we, it's an enormous job that's going to, what do you think Bloomberg's going to, he's going to 
he's going to try to extend it. Yes, well, the testimony we had from Chancellor Klein and all indicated that they would like to see mayoral control extended. And I think it's a strong possibility that yeah. will happen, but I also think that we have to look at what do the local community education councils really do and how do right. parents become empowered more in, the, in their own school atmosphere. And we have to look at each possibility to increase parental involvement because that's, many people think important. in this system that's been lost. Yeah, that's the major thing, hasn't it? Been? Yes. And also, I mean, we don't even understand the system, do we? Did you know about this special, this new thing that they had in the paper the other day about um, taking, writing an essay or taking a test and then you get your degree? What was that? Yes, there was something in the newspaper <laughs> that they're doing this, doing this as a substitute for other graduation criteria. Right. And some people think that that's watering down, and other people think that it's just as challenging. There's two, there's two schools of thought. That's interesting. Um, many times what goes on at the Department of Education does not come to the council. They don't have to come right. to the council. And we have to have oversight hearings that bring out these, these changes, and then we respond and we try to pressure. So education's been something that from a council perspective, because of the way the law is written, uh, we don't have as much input. In fact, many people have said that maybe better than mayoral control, we should have municipal control. Rather than going to Albany all the time for changes in legislation, the city council should be empowered to look at the school system and make changes. And do, and do the, the rules and the laws And we'll do the rules and the laws. I mean, one thing I've tried to tackle. Is that better than the mayor, do you think? Well, I think a mixture is better. Yeah. Yeah. I think a mixture. I do think the mayor is right, and previous mayors have been right, that there has to be accountability. Hold me accountable. Yes, I believe in that. But on the other hand, there has to be local parental involvement to the point where they are involved in where their child goes to school, and they not only are given information, but they have some type of input into policy. And I think as we empower principals, which is something we're certainly doing now, empowering yeah. principals, right. we have to look at what the school leadership teams do, how PTAs impact. We have to look at the whole That's structure. That whole balance, too, between the administration and, and the parents. And what is the balance? I is often there pose, a balance? Is there? <laughs> I mean, I, I often pose the question, uh, to be honest, uh, when a principal disagrees, with, when a parent disagrees with a principal, where does she it's go? The recourse, right. And really right now, your recourse is to email the chancellor. I think that we need better yeah. recourse for parents because, of course, we want parents and principals to work together, but there may be cases where parents do feel right. that they need an appeal mechanism based on a decision that is made. That's and, and And that's something we're looking at. That's very interesting. So you're going to be very busy for the next uh, year, six months especially, until you get around yes. to adulting. Um, do you find as a community activist and as a champion of people living in the city that you're able to satisfy their needs as well on the council as you were in the community board? Well, I, I feel that with the help of a, of a great staff I feel I, I've assembled, yeah. yes, uh, and, and then even more. Uh, anyone who ever tells you that the job of city councilman is part-time is Crazy. only talking about <laughs> maybe one or two people. I mean, my job is 24-7. Uh, I respond to emails. Well, you're uh, being generous. It may apply to more people, <laughs> but it doesn't apply to you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, go on. <laughs> I'm, always, I'm always at community meetings on weekends. I'm always involved, and my office serves constituents very, very well. I'm on top of things. I. I always say that I run into more people when I go food shopping, when I go to the drugstore, when I go to the dry cleaner, I go in the community on purpose right. because, first of all, I want to patronize local people, but on the other hand, I Me find everybody. out a lot of things when I'm, on the, uh, when I'm in the aisle shopping. I know exactly what you mean because it still <laughs> happens to me. I, go to, I love going to Fairway, and I always start and talk, and people, you know. And people always say to me, Jimmy, we hope that we're not bothering you. I say, no, you're not bothering me, and when I come home, my wife wife will say, Jimmy, where'd you go? Where have you been? <laughs> so she, she's very generous about your time. She's been great about my time for years. And uh, my parents, before I got married, yeah. were great about my time and the phone ringing late at night. And, and you have a daughter? Like that. I have a daughter, 13. Yes. And does she follow your interests? Yes. She's becoming increasingly interested in, in the national in political politics. scene right now with the presidential uh -huh. race. I know she follows that. Does she have a side? Excuse me? Who is she on her side? Does she have a candidate? <laughs> Well, It'd be I interesting because she's 13 years old, so 
it would be Obama with the younger people, but a woman running. So I, I was just interested. I, I have to say, at this point, I don't think she has a candidate, but I, I do think at certain points during the past six months, she has She's fluctuated between the two. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Because a 13 year old girl, that's yes. what it's all about. And they're getting to form their own opinions very, right. very strongly. They're getting to be issue oriented at that age. Mm -hmm. And they're very much a sponge when it comes to national well, politics sort of and, 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 and reading and learning and, and yeah. discussing. Do you work very closely with your community board? I assume you oh, do. Oh yes, yes. Do you have trouble with the new manager? Does he, does he or she think you're still managing? <laughs> well, no, I, I hope not. I try not to do that. Uh, I, I, I try even in my own office not to be involved in every single case. It's sometimes yeah. hard not to be involved in every single case. Right. I mean, certainly if someone tells me, uh, Jimmy, my tree was pruned and the tree branches were left behind, and I will report that through my staff, and a week later I'll see the tree branches still there, yes, I will get involved. And, and You'll well, report that to the community board? No, I report that through 311, the and then my staff follows up with parks. And uh, that's It's always been example. a question because, I mean, one of the most important assets for an elected official is a constituency, right? And you want to do things for them. And on the other hand, in a way, that's what the community board is there for also. So it's always a pull. Well, I've always had a policy, even at the community board, when I was there, people would come in about federal post office problems. Jimmy, I didn't get the mail. Yeah. And I always had it that I, I didn't turn anyone away. Right. I could have told them that Go the, the post kind. office has nothing to do with yeah. the community board. Right. But uh, I never turned them away. In fact, back in the early 90s, I had a public hearing on postal service in my community. And we had 300 people there. It was a big issue at the time. And that's beyond what a community board's purview is under the city charter. But you really, I, I think it's all encompassing. A community board is, is the nearest level of local government that people have. And I try to make our office like a little city hall when it came to neighborhood problems. It's very interesting. You, have very, you must be having a wonderful time. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Now let's, okay. so in, in a year there'll be an election and uh, 35 or 36 members, yes. well I think it's 35, I don't know, will not be back. So people are now already starting, are they, as who's going to be the new speaker? I think very preliminarily that, na that names are mentioned. I think it's probably much too soon even to start that, but very preliminarily. And you know, as you know, term limits will be clicking in yeah. f for the council and for the executive branch and for all the borough presidents. Right. So more than the speaker race, I think you hear about council members running for citywide office, borough-wide office. Many of them may take advantage of those opportunities because their terms have, will be expiring. Do you think it's good or bad that their terms are expiring? Well, I want you to know I have mixed feelings on term limits, and uh, I, I see an argument in favor of it, but I also see that uh, term limits have, have hurt, I think, the, the, the council. I think it will hurt when you have so many members coming on new. There's not a continuity right. uh, of service, and, and uh, I feel that uh, I would not be here if there were not term limits. My predecessor okay. may have run again, and I would not have run, but on the other hand, I see that with many others running for higher office and many others lame ducked, it does contribute to the committee structure and to the, the, the presence of members at various meetings. And, and I think the term limits ha have to be looked at again. And me, at least extended and staggered and all kinds of subtleties if you wanted to keep the term limits. Yes. I mean, I served in the council when it had no term limits, and that had a, a distinct downside also. New members never got to a point where they had a committee to chair or something, and older members were there 25, 30 years, so you, you began to see. I mean, if you can be in one job for 25 years, I don't know, there's something, I think this well, may be, you're a little bored and you should move on. <laughs> especially in, in a legislative body. Yeah. I think in a legislative body, 12 years is fair. Yeah. I, I think beyond that, that, right. that certainly, you know, I think that's you, may, you make a point that, that we don't want career politicians, I mean, right. and I think that's important to to, uh, yeah. to know. Do you, you when you ran? You're not part of the official part of the. I mean, of the Bronx political no, machine no, operation. I, I ran on my own, and uh, I won on my own. And does that affect you in the council? I would say, in, in a way, in the, in the beginning, it did. But I think that many of my colleagues feel that I'm capable and that uh, I, I know yeah. city government. You right. know, when I went to the council, I have to tell you, I knew the agencies, yeah. I knew you issues, had a head start, I knew <laughs> budget, and they, and and many of my colleagues said, "Boy, you know," and uh, Jimmy, and and I say, "Well, the district manager position is a wonderful training ground. If you were a good district manager who worked hard and you come to the council, you don't have you you, you don't have to start from scratch with these agencies." 
agencies. Right. Uh, many of these issues, uh, I had a, a general knowledge and a very neighborhood specific knowledge as well. It's a, but it does count when it comes to organization and stuff like that, especially if the county organizations are going to get together to select the speaker, basically. Well, right? I think that's, that's what will come into play yeah. in 2010. It's, that's too bad. Yeah. And what about all the brothers and the brothers and sisters, or mothers and daughters, or fathers and sons? And, and well, are that, we going to have another cycle of that? I, Is that I, what the, I, I hear the that gossip? we may. <laughs> I hear that we may. And uh, you know, I think the term limit somehow promotes that. That's because right. All of these exchanges. Exchanges, and uh, I, I think the term limits has to be analyzed, and, and that may be one of the contexts uh, to move Well, you are a great champion of a resident of residents in outer boroughs. I am. I wanted to be a champion <laughs> of residence in Manhattan. And I was always fascinated. I always tell the story that when I worked uh, for Robert Kennedy, um, I've even forgotten the sequence now, in the national campaign, and I would say something, and people would say, oh, she's from New York. You know? Then I went to work for Cuomo, and they'd say, oh, she's from New York City. Then I went to the city council, and they said, oh, she's from Manhattan, the west side of Manhattan, <laughs> no less. It made it really bad. But there's always this conflict in perceptions. you know. I consider myself a New York citizen that uh, has lived here all my life in the same neighborhood. I've lived as far north as 93rd and as far south as 67th Street, similar to you. And I think that the other boroughs, I used to describe the council as a suburban body because the other boroughs think anybody who lives in Manhattan is crazy. And for them, they're spoiled, they're rich, they're this, they're that, right? And so I walk around the street and I'm furious all the time because we pay 10 cents for 10 minutes, 25 cents for 10 minutes in the parking meters. We pay very high property taxes. We have all the traffic problems. Incidentally, you voted for the congested pricing, right? I did. That was a brave thing. Yes, it was brave. Uh, I, I'm someone who realizes that the traffic we now have in Manhattan has been backed up into my own community. That's right. And uh, on Bruckner Boulevard, Bruckner, Cross yeah. Bronx Expressway, the service roads, all that backup has to be dealt with. And of course, we have to try to improve mass transit. That's very good. That was a very admirable vote. I'm very proud of you. So tell me about it. What do you think of about a person who lives midtown Manhattan? Well, you do mention <laughs> that people on the council like myself often have an outer borough perspective. Yeah. And the outer borough perspective is a little different. And when you mention real estate taxes, I have to tell you that an outer borough perspective is that real estate taxes in, in this city are too high. And you pay about what, a percentage of what we pay, or what I'm paying. And, yeah. and if they're too high in the Bronx, you know, yeah. they're too high in Manhattan. But you'll hear the real estate tax refrain more from the outer boroughs. Right. Now, people will say, well, Jimmy, uh, you know, you, you keep talking about real estate taxes, but they haven't gone up since uh, 2001 World Trade Center when they were raised 18 percent after the attack. But my argument is that since 2001, assessments have skyrocketed. Right. So even though we haven't raised the rate, rate, the assessments went up. Now last year, for the first time, we decreased real estate taxes by 7 percent. Now, do you do you represent mostly single? A family. lot, a lot of one or and two family homes. Yes. Yeah. And we decreased the real estate tax by 7%. And Mayor Bloomberg, I think starting in 2003, gave the $400 yearly rebate. Now, the $400 yearly rebate did not even keep track of what the assessment increases were by any means. Right. The rate decrease for the first time meant that last year at least people broke even right. from where they were up. the year before. Right. Now we have a city economy in trouble, uh, possibly, although this year may not be that bad. But I'm starting to hear rumors that real estate taxes may go up. And again, this hits the same people. It's a regressive tax. It hits the same people over and over again. And I'm circulating a letter now among my colleagues uh, to the mayor asking that he not take that route, which is often pretty easy to take. Other mayors have taken it when well, they see a gap. it's the one tax that the city, that the mayor can, the city can change, basically. Yes, it's the one tax the city yeah. can raise without going to the state. Right. And so it is tempting to, to an executive right. to do that. But I think that when, when we're expecting these rebates from President Bush and he's going to put money back in our pockets, hopefully to refuel the national economy, to then take with one hand and give with the other, or we'll give with the other and take, take with, with the other, that, that's going backward. It's counterproductive. Yeah. So we have that letter circulating because I want to make sure real estate taxes don't go up. And another issue affecting outer boroughs right now is the water rates. Right. The water rates are scheduled to go up again. It's become confiscatory. The, the water rates have gone up every year in, in double digits, and we face another situation with water rates. And people were originally told when the water meters went in, well, if you, say, if you conserve water, 
you'll be fine. If you conserve water, your bills will go down. That has not been the case. Our bills have gone up every year, and they're going that's up a, again. And that's a tax most likely that the members from Manhattan don't pay too much attention to because right. it gets hidden. It gets right. hidden. In yeah. Manhattan, often it gets hidden. But, yeah. but to a homeowner in Throgs Neck and yeah. Morris Park, yes. And when we talk about affordable housing, what we have to remember is that affordable housing means tenants, but homeowners, if they continue to get socked with real estate and water rate increases, have no choice often, especially if they're senior citizens or newly arrived immigrants yeah. or if they're facing foreclosure issues. They will have no choice but to pass it along to the tenant, yeah. and then that rental yes. becomes less affordable. But And, and I, I know that you were active in zoning in part of your district. Yes. But, in, I mean, the thing that always affected me or interests me is what happens in Manhattan eventually is going to happen el elsewhere. That's what I, what I tried to tell them with the property taxes because, you know, as the market goes up in Manhattan, people move and then they keep moving, moving, moving. So you've seen development in your district that you most likely wouldn't have seen if people stayed where they were and it all was yes. the same, right? We've had overdevelopment in my area and uh, we have downzoned my entire council district because we want to keep development in context with what was pre-existing. We did not want the new homes going up multifamily with no parking, no infrastructure, and uh, we, we're still having fights. We're still on, I'm still on the buildings department website every day checking every new permit, every new alteration. We're on top of it, my office and I, and we are still objecting to building department applications and reducing density. But it's be, it, it, it is a fight. It is a fight, it, it is a fight to limit, the, limit overdevelopment. To the accidents that occur in Manhattan, do you pay attention to them also? Oh, absolutely. Right. The same building regulations and oversight and inspections and self-certification and all this yes. stuff that goes on, right? I've long believed that this uh, self-certification where an architect can go to the building's department and say, what I have filed is true, here's my yeah. signature. I believe that that's got to be right. a thing of the past. We have to put resources into the building's department so every application is analyzed. And so, so what else does an outer borough resident think about Manhattan residents? Well, we come to Manhattan every day. We, we come here for shopping, for theater, for culture. We come here for, you, you for come jobs. You come downtown, right. We come downtown. <laughs> but you know, I live on 68th Street, and I still say I'm going downtown. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. You still it's, say it. It, it. It's a whole, and we're moving. I mean, I'm almost now in the Central Business District. That's expanding north and north and north, and which will eventually affect you because then the, you know, the gentrification's going to Harlem, it's going up to Inwood, Washington Heights, and it'll go over. But, um, it's such a different perception. I mean, it just fascinates me. Well, many of the issues that come to the council uh, are not uh, really interest, are not interesting to outer borough members because it doesn't pertain to their yeah. neighborhood. Right. But yet, as a city council person, as you know, you have to have a local perspective and a citywide perspective. And if you don't know what's going on in Manhattan, well, you should know. Right. And it's my responsibility to know what's going on in neighborhoods throughout the city. And I often read things that many people would say, Jimmy, it's not your district, but well, no, I have questions. Yeah. Why is this going yeah. on? And don't get me wrong, a lot of it often leads back to my district because so much of what a councilman does is district-based. But when it comes to policy and perspective, I think an effective councilman has to be citywide in, in his outlook as well. Absolutely. It's a big responsibility. It's a big responsibility to, to do the job right. There's got to be that perspective and that understanding and, and, and ability to listen to people and learn. None of us go to any committee meeting knowing everything about every issue. And as you know, much of the information we get is technical. So it requires an understanding and an, an, an analysis. And it requires some sometimes tough questioning. But it also, you depend on the... the um, users of the services and the citizens to really highlight where the problems are and where the needs are. Yes. You never get that from the administration. No. And that's what's you have so listen. important. And that's the shame about many hearings is that they don't get to testify till the end of the hearing and by that time nobody. Well, I, nobody I, but you is there. Well, that's, that's it. And, and, <laughs> nobody and, and, but and me. <laughs> sitting in on the hearings but also listening to advocates. Yeah. Uh, I've learned a lot from people who are advocates for senior citizens, right. animal rights, many things that I did not know about relative to animal rights right off the bat I tell you I did not know about but now I am aware and I've been sensi sensitized to it. So yes, <laughs> part of my job is to meet with people, listen, learn, read, and, you know, you sometimes learn more by listening than talking. Absolutely. So what do you see as the future? You come, you're going to run for re-election. I intend to. You're not going to be opposed. 
by oh, a I Democrat. Know. I don't know. I would certainly too hope soon. not. I would hope not. All right. And then that's another four years. So yes. what do you see after that? Well, I haven't given it much thought. Uh, I, I very much enjoy what I'm doing. And uh, if in 2013 I have to make a decision, but that seems like so long, so long away that I... But it happens so fast. <laughs> I know it happens fast. As I've said, I've seen my daughter grow up and these things happen overnight. But, yeah. it, but as the years go on, I'll, I'll think of... Uh, what my, where my right. life will take me. Do you think that there should be a new way of organizing legislative bodies? Have you thought about that? I always thought about that. <laughs> well, I think that the committee system has to be looked at. How many people are serving on a committee? I've always thought that was important. I think some of our committees are too large, and if they're too large, they cannot focus as much on an issue. Um, Identifying issues committee, committees meet on, that's always been uh, interesting to me because I don't believe in meeting for a meeting's sake, but I do believe that there has to be a focus. Mm -hmm. I, do th I do think that term limits somehow gives an inordinate reliance to staff because the mm -hmm. staff is there for years and you rely on them for your working papers and for your briefings and, and things like that. So a lot of that should be council member uh, 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 originated. So yes, I, I do think that we always have to look to reform a legislative body to make it better. Uh, but I, I don't want change for change's sake. I, I would want to assess how effective what's going on now uh, is as well. Well, it's, you know, we're at the end of our program. So oh, it's so quite yes. amazing. This has been great. <laughs> so I thank it. you very much for coming. Thank and I hope you. you'll come back again. And I'd love especially to. as we head towards the next election and all the issues that come up and, and the whole thing. And But I just um, wish every council member was like you. Oh, so boy. thank you, Jimmy. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>